Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. I'm wondering how many of us, we really don't see the need. We, we know because we're smart enough and kids were mature enough to know that there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done. Some of us, the needs are so great and so many that we almost, we zone out. We just kind of like, I don't want to say deny it, but we want to ignore it, thinking that if I ignore the need, it goes away. It doesn't do that, my friends. Generally, it exacerbates if we don't get on top of this thing. A drippy faucet, a car that needs oil. You know, there's a problem and it's going to exacerbate and get worse. So Jesus saw the particular need. Now here's a question because you're not Jesus and I'm not Jesus. How did Jesus know about this guy? He saw this guy, he saw all those problems. How did he know about it? I think there are three possible answers. I think two of them are probably the answer, but the one of them is a shot in the dark. It's possible that while Jesus was traveling to and into Jerusalem, someone might have said, look, there's a pool with a bunch of people over there. Jesus probably would have known that because he'd been around Jerusalem. And then someone might have said, look at all these people over here. A lot of them have needs, but this guy, he's the oldest bloke over here. He's 38 years waiting for this water. Why don't you go help him? Is it possible that someone told Jesus? Is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? I don't think so. So how else did he know it? Well, I believe Jesus is God, and I think you do too. So it's highly likely that God the Father spoke to God the Son, and so there was a God message to him about this because they were in sync. All right, I think that's a high probability. Another could be this, since I do believe that Jesus is all God, that you had the, 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 the deity part of God, the all God part of Christ, communicating to the humanity part of Christ about this need. So the God part of Christ explaining about, in some measure, that message of this person to the humanity part of Christ, then Christ would then look because all this is happening at once. Now, I lean more on that than I possibly do even the second, although I'm never going to split that theological hair. But here's what I'm going to take home from that. I'm going to say this. A lot of needs around me. I need to be alert by saying there are needs. When I come to church, there are needs. Kids, when I go home this afternoon, there's stuff to be done around the house. Parents, there's stuff to do with your kids. There's stuff that has to be done. We have to know that. But now, what we're going to do is we're going to allow the, the, the Godhead, in a sense, the Holy Spirit, to speak to our spirit, to sense what needs to be done now. What do we need? Who needs the most love touch now? Where do I need to get my hands dirty now? What time do I need to sacrifice now to take initiative? So I believe there is, as we're yielding to God within us, I believe that's going to be the help to know how to define what things about which we take initiative. And so keep that in mind. He saw, and then look at him here. Circle the word him. Now there's a lot of needs. We talked about that, but he did single out one. And perhaps you might want to look at one person. Now, what I took away from that, and maybe you could take away from that is this, is that he, he looked at the man. He didn't say he saw a cripple. He saw him. He saw the man. Most needs are connected to people. They're, they're, all task needs are still connected to relationships. So when you're doing the task, some of you are task-oriented, so you'll jump to the task. But remember, it's not just about the task. Listen very carefully. It's all about the person who really has the need. So you want to do it on a relation. You want to build a relationship with the person based on the task. So look at people. Look at your son. Look at your daughter. Look at your brother. Look at your sister. What does she need today? What can I do to help them? What does mom need today? What is the guy helping in our connection group? What could I do to lighten his or her load? What about at work? The guy who shares the cubicle. The one who parks his truck next to mine. What about them? What do they need? So look at them, him, her. Then it says lying there. Well, that's just simple. He's lying there because he couldn't get there. He was either withered or he's lame or something. He couldn't get to where he needed to go. So basically he needed help. Then it says, Jesus says, and he knew that already. He had been in that condition a long time. We talked about that. He said to him, do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered him. 
Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. So for whatever reason, watch this now, the sick man thought that the only way his need could be met was that way. He did not know that there was another person that could meet his need, which was Christ. He'll find out in a matter of moments. So he was trying to get his need met another way. Then it says here, while I'm coming down there, someone gets in ahead of me and I miss my chance. And I love what Jesus said here. He said, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Now you got your pens ready? Circle the word rise. So he says, stand up, take up your bed, which means now lift up what you're sleeping, like a sleeping bag, guys, gals. It's like taking your sleeping bag. It's like taking your mat. Some of you that sleep on a mat in your home, I know some of you do that. You know what I'm, who I'm referring to. So take up your bed, whatever it might be. I don't know if I'm going to take up the bed I sleep in at the house. I can barely lift the mattress. I don't know how Carol puts on the sheet. She's been gone the last two weeks. So I'm, I got the bedroom all clean. I vacuumed. I washed every floor, literally, on my hands and knees. I cleaned every bathroom except the bathroom I've used while she was gone. It right now looks like a bachelor pad bathroom. So I'm going to get in there with a blowtorch just before I get on a plane. But I'm going to tell you, lifting that mattress is hard stuff. This man, he took up his bed. That's not the big point. The big point is, it says here, look what else and walked. Now what's interesting is that he didn't just walk, it said he kept on walking. It's in a tense that means he didn't take a step. He didn't wobble. He stood up, which he couldn't do before, and it was kind of like, oh, wow, 38 years. It didn't say from birth, so he probably knew how to walk before. Then he got crippled, and all of a sudden he got his walk back. Then it says he'd take up your bed, which means he wasn't a weak, shriveling up guy. He was strong enough. So God gave him strength not only to stand up, but to carry something. But not only to stand up and carry something, but also to move. He had motion. And it said, and immediately the man was made well. Now, underline the word immediately. Now, I don't have time to talk about faith healers here. But you'll find that whenever Jesus did it, it was immediate. He took up his bed and he continued walking. So here are the principles. Let's go through these quickly. Number one, go where the needs are. That's what Jesus did. Go where the needs are. You can assume where they are, but you've got to go with them. Don't hide in your bedroom. Don't hide behind a computer. Don't hide in your truck. Don't hide at a lonely beach. Don't hide in the mall. I don't mean you can't go to the beach. You can't go to a quiet place. You can't. I didn't say you can't use your computer. I'm just saying we hide. We use these things thinking that we're meeting needs. And at all those places, there are going to be needs. So just go where the needs are. Let the Spirit of God lead you. Number two, be alert to what needs to be done. Be alert to what needs to be done. So in other words, see what's out there, what really needs to be done. Next, pick out what, you, pick out what might be the greatest need you can meet. Maybe it's not all the needs you can meet, but you might pick out the greater need that can be done. Pick out what might be greatest now again, all of this is wrapped up in skill set and timing and ability. And uh, you, you young people here, some of you might really say, "I want to take on the needs of the world," but you've got to do it underneath mom and dad's authority. So find out what direction they would give you, but pick out what might need to be the greatest need to be met, and then finally be the first to take action to meet the need. Be the first to take action to meet the need. Do you agree with me that it's possible that if this man was crippled and he was in this porch and he had nobody to take him down when the water stirred, that probably no family showed up or hung around with him or visited him to be there to take him down? Nobody was there. So he probably was all alone. Can you imagine? Just be weird with me for a moment. Can you imagine how long his fingernails must have been? His toenails must have been? Can you imagine how long his hair must have been? Can you imagine how much he stinketh? Can you imagine he was probably a skinny guy because he didn't eat much, whatever he could crawl to or get food or somebody would throw him some junk that they didn't want, you know? Can you imagine what this guy looked at? And yet Jesus says, what do you want? He says, I want to be made well. I can't get down there. Boom. Jesus did not meet all the needs of this guy, so he wouldn't, watch this, this is cool. So this man wouldn't become codependent merely on Christ. Now, we do need to be dependent upon the Lord, but it's not just let go, let God. It's let go, let God help us do what we should do, all right? We're sometimes the hands and feet for God. We lean on Him, but it still comes out through us. I do serve the Lord in the flesh, but not the old nature. Shouldn't. All right, so what I'm saying, everybody, you've got a lot of needs out there. Ask God to lead you. At least pick one need, what that means. The second thing as I look is that I don't 
I don't look at this guy over here being so great. There's no, there's no statement. In other, there's no statement where this man had great faith. So the Lord says, oh, look at your faith. I'm going to heal you. There's other portions of Scripture where this person had faith and your faith saved you. Your faith healed you, all that. But not here. This guy wasn't a great guy. He didn't bless God. He didn't even know Jesus as God. Just some guy walking by the pool. And so what I take from that is this. Jesus didn't pick out the deserving ones. I don't know. It could be that Jesus picked him out because he was the least deserving. I don't know that. I can't build a whole case on that. But I can't say he's the most deserving. So where am I going with all this? Some of us, we will meet everybody's needs who scratch my back first. Then I'll scratch your back. Most of us will help others if they helped us first. And so we keep a long list of that. And so if they do certain things, then we'll meet a need. Sometimes, before you can minister to someone, you have to meet their need, felt need. You're driving for their real need, which is a spiritual need. But sometimes, before you get to the spiritual, they're not going to hear your voice on the spiritual till you put in some sweat equity on the felt need. So, it's not always the ones who most deserve it. I don't know who that might speak to, but it sure spoke to me on that. Young people, I'm going to give you one other thought here. And I'm not speaking against you at all. I just like to... I wish right now that we'd been at the beach together and we had a great day surfing, boogie boarding, and all this stuff. I really do, because what I'm about to tell you here is going to be a truth that if you learn what I'm about to tell you, the principle, it will help you the rest of your life. But I hope you let me speak in your life. And I love you. And parents, you listen to this too. We're going to talk about um, subordinates with... Uh, I don't hate the word superior, but say, you know, the person above you that has the authority over you. There, are, there is a time that we, we grow to a point where we finally say, we really do want to please our authority figure, mom or dad. We really want to please wives, the husband. We really want to please our employer. We really do that. So we want to take initiative in pleasing them. Now, here's the difference between a mature Christian and a super mature Christian. You want to please the person their way, not your way. Sometimes we want to please them. We do it our way. And when our, when our authority figure doesn't give us that attaboy or that atta girl, then we get angry. We say, well, they don't want to do that. And so after a long period of that, we get into this thing called passive aggression. And we don't do anything for that person. When in reality, all they wanted you to do is to do the thing their way and not necessarily your way. So you might have a servant's heart, but really you're serving yourself because you want it done your way. You want to find out, what do you want me to do? And you want to, that's the difference between obedience and honor. Obedience is just doing the job. Honor says, I want to find out what is the way they really want me to do this here. How do they, you can take out the garbage or you can take out the garbage. You know what I'm trying to say? So if you really learn that now, I'm going to give you one other thought. Stay with me. This, I'm almost, I'm, this is really cool here. That's good, good teaching. But now, you not only want to do that, you not only want to please them, you not only want to please them your way, you want to please them their way, and then you want to please them God's way. So in the whole mix of all of this, you're saying, okay, Lord, I'm not really doing it for my authority figure. I'm really doing it for you. And so, Lord, how do I do this? In most cases, the Lord will then tell you, do it the way your boss wants it. Do the way your mom and dad. They might not always be the... You might have it a better way. You've been around, maybe you saw more. You could maybe give them your opinion in love, humbly, sweetly, as a student and a learner, but then leave it up to them. And if they say, I want it done this way, then you cheerfully do it that way. And if it blows up, it'll blow up in their face because they gave you poor direction. But you can say, I did it right. That's taking initiative. Now, I don't know, but it'd sure be neat if I had one guy and one girl that would take that truth and live it the rest of their life. How different this world would be. All right, number three. What could I do to demonstrate initiative? We talked about this, so we'll go through it quickly. Not wait to be told to do something that I know needs to be done. There's certain things you already know it needs to be done, so don't wait to be told to do it. I'm talking about staff and people and workers and employers and employees. Whatever needs to be done, get it done. Explore new areas of service opportunities so I can be more useful to Jesus Christ. In other words, I want to get out there. What more can be done? What could I do? What's my skill set? What's my gifting? What's my personality? What needs have I heard? What needs do I anticipate? What can be done? Don't wait to be asked. 
Find out how to get the key to unlock the door to get to the broom. Go and do it. Then relieve pressure from those around me by taking the lead in lightening their load. All right? You want to relieve their pressure, but don't wait for someone else to relieve their pressure. You be the one to do that. And in most cases than not, the one who had the pressure relieved is going to come back and they're going to thank you and you're going to take, watch this, you're going to be on the highest road that everybody else wants to be up there, but they don't want to travel that road because it's too high and too lonely. They want to stay with the pack that does their own stuff their way. All right, but that lonely road up at the top, you take that high road. I'm going to tell you, that's where the scenery is. That's where the cool air is. That's where the best view is. And that's where God's going to bless you. So relieve the pressure from those around you by taking the lead. You take the lead. Number four, there are dangers in having initiative? Yes, there is. By judging others for not having initiative. <laughs> How many of you that have taken initiative for so long and finally feel like you're the ones that are doing all the work because nobody else does it? And so then it's easy for you to get a sour, grumpy attitude and then basically quit or go to some other job or another church or another relationship. Second, beware of taking initiative, and some of us will, and then quitting without completing the task. Nothing frustrates a parent, nothing frustrates a boss more than when you show initiative to start with, but you kind of fizzle out halfway through the program. I'm sure glad that when a doctor decides to do surgery on me halfway through, he doesn't say, you know what, I, this isn't as cool as I thought it was. I got some other things I need to do, so I go do that. I'm glad they didn't quit. I'm glad that Jesus didn't start the pro process by coming to the earth and he lived a perfect sinless life and then all of a sudden people turned on him and then they started to beat him and then they put him on the cross and he said I had enough of this he didn't do that he stayed with the whole thing all the way to the end when he was totally alone in the initiative that he took there's my example if he can take it to the end I can take it to the end one more that's not in your notes beware of thinking that every request constitutes a need you can't do everything. You'll, you'll, you'll explode. I want to end this. I think it's a good time for us to land the plane. First of all, if some of you have had conversations recently about you never do anything around the house and you never help out here or you don't do that, I want you to know no parent call me, no boss call me, no teacher call me. God called me in a sense. And he said, I need you to speak on this. And so instead of looking to an earthly model, although there's probably many that I could have paraded up, athletes, people in music, people in the arts, people in leadership, people in history, people in the Bible, right now the greatest example of initiative is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to think with me for just a moment. He looked upon the earth. He didn't just see starving, sick, wicked people. He saw people that were going to spend eternity in hell. And he says, nobody can meet their need. They can't meet their need by doing good deeds. Every religious leader that's ever popped up to offer them an escape plan can't meet their needs. They're giving them candy for medicine. That's not working. He said, I'm the only one that can meet their need. Now, I don't understand all about God and everybody has a need. Not everybody goes to heaven. Not everybody receives the need meter the Lord Jesus Christ. But he did take initiative. The Godhead, watch this, this is so cool. Scripture says, before man ever fell, the plan of salvation was already in place. He was so much a need meter that he knew man would have a need before he had a need. Now think about that around your house. Then go back here. And so he said, there's the need. And so he did everything. He put up the whole game plan in the Old Testament. He lived it in the Gospels and he followed it up in the Epistles. All about the need for man to have a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he initiated the communication of that, the payment for that, the gift for that, the conviction of the Spirit telling you that you need Christ and you better respond to that. And then the sealing of it so we'll never have to go to hell after we've trusted Christ. That's the initiator. And it's so cool that after he does all this, he doesn't say, okay, you're on your own. He also takes initiative then to prompt us, teach us, guide us, fill us, empower us, all the rest. That's the kind of initiator we have. 
So let's just take a moment right now and bow our heads and close our eyes and let's go to this great initiator and let's thank him that we were by our own pool lost and we were in our own state of infirmity and our infirmity wasn't a health one although I, I feel for any of you that are listening that have found out you have cancer or a financial one, any of you that lost your job recently or any of you that have had a broken relationship. I, I, I know that. And they're horrible and painful. And I know that's the nasty here and now. But that's, we're, you still need Jesus. You need Jesus to go to heaven. You need Jesus in your life to help navigate through these un, unseen, unknown times. So why don't you simply right now remember that the Lord Jesus Christ loves you. He loves the world. And right now you're a part of the world. And forget about all the seven billion people and you just think of yourself God loves you he already went to the cross to pay for your sin he went to the cross to pay for your sin and he rose again from the dead he loves you he loved you to get you to hear this message today however you're hearing this he loved you to make sure you heard that going to heaven is not by good deeds it's not by living a separated life to God. It's by admitting that you're a sinner and you're desperate for a Savior and you receive Christ as your only Savior, trusting Him to forgive you of all sin. He brought you that message because He loves you, because He's willing that you would not perish. He wants to meet your need. Can you imagine for a moment with me this paralyzed guy and the Lord said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And this man said, nah, you got to be crazy. I don't know who you are, man. Don't you know I can do this? Well, I don't need that. What I need is you to drag me down to the water. How stupid. How ridiculous. Yet how common it is today. Would you right now just run to Christ in your mind and just throw yourself in his ever-loving arms and say, thank you for dying on the cross and paying for my sins. Thank you for initiating my salvation because, man, I can't do it. I need you. Now, you can put it in a prayer. You could do a mental transaction as long as you are totally and only trusting Christ. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around, is there anyone in here by that uplifted hand would indicate to me that you're trusting Christ as your Savior? right now and you'd like for me to pray for you put it up real high right now you're doing it right now anyone at all all right Christians let me leave you with one last initiation I will always be concerned with a church that wants to be a great church and a lot of fun and a safe place for people to come etc but a church that neglects to see the real needs of people that are lost and going to hell I wonder how many vehicles passed our church on the poly today of people in it that probably did not know Christ as Savior. Jesus initiated all of this so we would go to heaven. That same Jesus is inside of us. Will we now simply said, take initiative to connect to lost people, to clear our calendar from all of the clutter that we have, to think we're doing a great job by merely making Christians better. As good as that is, I'm not minimizing that, but I want to maximize the fact that we need also to connect to lost people. Who did you talk to this week for the purpose of building a relationship that you will not leave, a relationship with an unsaved person that you will try to help them to come to hear the message of the gospel, either through you or some material that you give to them, or someone that you bring them to hear that's going to communicate the gospel clearly and correctly. And you're going to do that. Sometimes I wonder what we'd be like if someone didn't take the initiative to bring that to us. I thank the Lord for Carol. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we prepare now for our time of communion, we know that you're right here. You've been here all the time, but in a sense you're going to be here in an object lesson of bread and juice. And so, Lord, we're going to reflect on this as we look upon you who died and rose again. And as we partake of this communion, that our heart would be pure before you. I pray that as we look at this, that we're taking communion, that you came, you took initiative, and you're coming back, you're taking initiative. 
that now you, the initiator, lives within us, that we would serve mankind and be an initiator about you. Now, Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.